Hello there, this is Coden. And this is Cassia. And welcome to the Ebon Hawk, a podcast where we discuss Star Wars, Knights of the Republic, as well as all things Star Wars. Today, we'll be discussing Joseph Campbell, the hero's journey, also known as the monomyth, and George Lucas, Skywalker Saga. This is episode 12, and this is where the fun begins. <laughs> episode is going to be a little bit different. Uh, We're going to be examining the roots of Star Wars rather than the branches. Without Joseph Campbell uh, and the hero's journey, there like George Lucas might not have been inspired to write and direct and create Star Wars as we know it today. And without Star Wars, there wouldn't have been offshoots like Knights of the Old Republic. So we're going to just kind of look at the inspiration for like the whole Star Wars saga. But if you look at it, the roots lead to the branches. So even if we're not overtly talking about Knights of the Old Republic, it's in there, you know. So it'll just be a little bit of a different episode, but we're pumped for it. It. It'll probably be the first of like a little bit of a series. So I guess to get started, who is Joseph Campbell? So Joseph Campbell, he is probably the most famous comparative mythological scholar of all time. He's been my idol since I started reading The Hero of a Thousand Faces. I was reading it like my senior year of high school. And in that book, Campbell broke down the world's mythologies to their core, and he revealed the archetypal hero's journey woven throughout them all. It was a transformative book for me, and the reason I was reading it is because I love Star Wars, and I wanted to write something like that one day. And I was just researching, like, what inspired George Lucas. And I saw things like The Seven Samurai, Flash Gordon, Buck Rogers. But there was this book, The the Hero with a Thousand Faces. And I just knew I had to read it. It was not light reading, though. It, like, took me, like, two years to read. But it definitely was a transformative book. It made me see that the world was more interconnected than it appeared on the news because when it comes down to it we all share the same stories and it made me like pay more attention to books when I read them, movies when I watched them, video games when I played them and even like sometimes in music I just noticed there's a pattern and they all kind of utilize the hero's journey not like Sometimes not overtly, or sometimes like step A, B, or C, but it it was really cool. And then like after I read it, I, like life doesn't work exactly like if you go through like say some hard times, like it doesn't mean like you're gonna get the job you want, more money, or any of that, you know, like life does kind of follow some patterns, it's not like necessarily like a book. And the reason why you kind of see the hero's journey, all these mythologies, is because it's about human life and human behavior, you know? So when you study stories, you're kind of studying people's lives, in a way. And because I read the book, I began to see myself as the hero, or I guess heroine, of my own story. It pushed me to live a fuller and more vital life and live more intentionally you know so that was long but that's who joseph campbell is and what he means to me so the the novel the hero of a thousand faces is that does that fall like one particular story or does that cover different situations that relate to the steps of the journey i guess so it doesn't just follow one 
mythological story. It was written in 1949, and this is kind of like the hero of the Thousand Faces was like the first of its kind. Campbell was one of the first to recognize the pattern and articulate it. And so in his book, he looks at all, all of these different stories throughout the world, like the Odyssey, um, some Native American stories, King Arthur, Jonah and the Whale. And he breaks, he breaks down the hero's journey into like three categories, departure, initiation, and return. Like if you look at the hero's journey, it looks like a circle. And the top of the circle is where you begin and you kind of divide the circle into the the top of the circle is the known world and the unknown is the bottom of it and the known world is where you begin and so the hero's journey is broken into the departure from the unknown the initiation into the unknown and then the return into the known so it's like a circle like the journey you're meant to close the circle so if you see the Joseph Campbell Foundation's logo, it's like a circle that's just about closed. So it, it's kind of a fun detail that they have in their logo. With the hero's journey, uh, it kind of breaks down into three different parts, right? It breaks down to the departure, the initiation, and then the hero's return. Do you want to kind of go over the, the departure and how it relates to the Skywalker saga? Yeah. So... The categories of departure are the call to adventure, refusal of the call, supernatural aid, and cross the crossing of the first threshold, and the belly of the whale. So the call to adventure, you could probably say that if we we're looking at the original Star Wars, The uh, New Hope, the call to adventure is when Luke receives the message from Leia that she needs help and because that changes Luke's life because he's basically just a farm boy you know and nothing in his life is really happening until that point it's like when when you get the call and it's something you can't ignore it's like a call into something totally different from the status quo that you're used to. Like, it's pulling you into the unknown. I guess you could say Frozen 2 literally has a voice calling to Elsa into the unknown. It's like, I didn't really enjoy that movie, but that song serves its purpose, you know? Mm -hmm. And then, like, at, at some point, uh -huh. I guess it's, like, kind of part of it to like refuse the call of, for example, in Star Wars, Luke sort of dismisses it at first and tells Obi-Wan that he could take him to Mos Eisley, but he has to get back home to tend the farm. And that that's kind of like the, the served initial refusal. Yeah. Because in a lot of books or like stories, the hero kind of really does want to leave. But then when it comes to it, they're like, do I want to leave everything I know behind and go into the unknown on a hard journey? And like, I might not have, you know, Wi-Fi there and I have to go through all this stuff. Do I do I really want to do that? And it's like, nah, I'd rather just be able to sleep in my own bed and sleep in, you know. So sometimes the hero, it's like, I don't know if it's like out of like, they feel like they're obligated or they're scared or they feel like they're not up to the task. They're like, nah, I'm not going to go. So Luke says, like, that's great. I can take you there, but I'm going to go back to the home. But then in A New Hope, Luke sees that his aunt and uncle are dead. So he's like, I guess I have no choice and I want to become a Jedi like my father before me. The next step would be receiving supernatural aid. Uh, and this can be like meeting a wise old mentor, like Luke meets, you could say, Obi-Wan Kenobi, or he knows him as Ben. 
Anakin in The Phantom Menace meets Qui-Gon Jinn, and in The Hobbit, Bilbo meets Gandalf. Meeting this mentor figure uh, it gives them the supernatural aid, like when they would maybe be imperiled if they were alone. So what's this? What's this last piece? The belly of the well. The next step is the crossing of the first threshold, and that is, I suppose you could say, like when Luke is looking down at Mos Eisley, which is a hive of scum and villainy. Luke was living in the equivalent of maybe the Midwest, you know? He's living in a state like no one lives in. And then he has to go to a bigger city. He's a small farm boy, like, he's not used to it, and he's kind of scared. So it's like, you're moving from the known status quo of your life into the unknown. So it's like, that's taking that first step into a world of adventure and it's like it's not always safe so yeah that is crossing of the first threshold okay i was kind of curious as we're talking about the crossing is the enabling of luke going on this journey with obi-wan was the the deaths of his aunt and uncle would would that be like a supernatural intervention that enables him for the crossing or would you say that could, I was thinking that maybe the the first step was that enabling and then the the journey to Moss Eisley is like jumping in the deep water for Luke yeah going to Moss Eisley is his crossing of the threshold I suppose you could say like for the story's sake like supernatural aid like it, it is a good coincidence that his aunt and uncle are killed. I would say that the supernatural aid is Obi-Wan rescuing Luke from Tusken Raiders. And then the belly of the whale, it's named after the Book of Jonah story. It's kind of like where, this is coming from Campbell, it's the idea that the passage of the magical threshold is a transit into a sphere of rebirth. It's is symbolized in the worldwide womb image of the belly of the whale. The hero, instead of conquering or consolating the power of the threshold, is swallowed into the unknown and would appear to have died. This popular motif gives example to the lesson that the passage of the threshold is a form of self annihilation. Instead of passing outward, beyond the confines of the visible world, the hero goes inward to be born again. And I guess you could say, like, an example of this is in the Pinocchio tale, when Pinocchio and Geppetto are swallowed up by the whale. And then, you know, obviously the Book of Jonah. In Star Wars, you could say, like, the Empire Strikes Back, Han Solo and Princess Leia have to take shelter in a cave and you know it's the giant space slug and then Darth Vader also has his meditation chamber so I guess you could say like those are kind of like some of the belly of the whale moments okay so like departure it's basically like when you leave what you know behind and you decide to go forward into the unknown which takes us to the initiation. And the initiation, it begins with the Road of Trials. It's like a series of tests that the hero has to undergo to begin the transformation, kind of like learn the ropes, if you will, of the unknown. And usually the hero will, like, will fail a few times, but then they'll succeed a few times, and then sometimes that leads the hero to get a little bit like, gung ho, like, oh, what are you gonna do? Like, kill me? Because, like, I know how to, like, fight people, and usually they have to deal with some pride, too. So, I guess you could say, like, in Star Wars, like, they are on the, the Death Star, and they have to fight all these stormtroopers, escape, and then also in Empire Strikes Back, you, you have Luke, and he is 
attacked by Wampa's Imperial forces, and Han and Leia have to like go through an asteroid field. So those would be some of the road of trials. It's like it's kind of like a road trip because road trips. It's kind of like the fun part of the story. And, like, road trips, they're fun, but then usually there's always some, like, unprecedented problems that you have. Like, your car, no matter what, it's going to have a problem. You're going to get lost at one point. You'll lose your signal or something. So, mm-hmm. and then it's like, literally a road of trials. Yeah, and, like, Luke's perspective, he, he uh, submerges his X-Wing into the swamps of Dagobah and like and then he has to kind of put up with Yoda's kind of difficult teaching and um and then on the the flip side you got Han and Leia over at Bespin and uh, their predicament with the empire yeah and it's like what the hero's journey is meant to kind of embody is is a story about growing up so these are kind of like the pitfalls of growing up the road of trials the departure phase it's like you're a kid but then at a certain point you have to be initiated like grow up you know and like at the beginning of the initiation you're still not an adult but sometimes you think you are so sometimes like instead of like being like a confident adult who knows what they're doing like you kind of have like the swagger and bravado like i know what i'm doing like it's kind of like when you're like 18 or 19 and think you know everything about the world, but you know, you really don't. It's kind of like that phase. So it's kind of fun to write and to experience in people's stories. The next phase it is the meeting with the goddess. Uh, it's where the hero gains items given to him that will help him in the adventure. And I love the story of Perseus, and he's probably a hero that was, like, given, like, literally way too much. Uh, He was given, like, a helmet that would make him invisible, like, a good shield that's, like, capable of killing Medusa. Or a good sword that's capable of killing Medusa, and a shield that he can use to see the reflection of Medusa, and flying shoes, like... He should have just chosen the one that gave him the most joy and decluttered a bit, but I guess that's what you could say, like, that phase is. And Luke, he's literally given, like, his father's lightsaber, like, it's the legacy saber, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's actually kind of funny, because when when you first watch Star Wars, like, he was holding it, like, up against his eye, and if he would have accidentally ignited it, it's like, well story's over you know like he killed himself accidentally so i'm just glad he didn't accidentally ignite it then or else star wars would be a whole lot shorter and sadder so (laughs) yep yeah keep the business end pointed away and then the next step is called the woman is temptress and it doesn't mean like the woman necessarily had like It doesn't mean a woman necessarily has to tempt the hero, but it's kind of just like the temptations of the hero. And it can just be like, I would rather, you know, go home and have a good meal and just sleep in my bed, you know, like Ron was wanting in Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, wanting to basically like give up the quest and have like a good life like in the odyssey calypso tempts odysseus like saying like i don't think your wife is as awesome as i am you know you can just stay on this nice island or you can go back home to ithaca where you know you don't know if you're even wanted there if your island's taken over why go on but then the hero decides to go on and i guess you could say the woman is temptress in the original trilogy of Star Wars is, like, Luke accidentally kind of, like, you know, likes his sister, not realizing, you know, it's his sister, so, which is, you know, kind of gross, but it happened, so, yeah. Even at the same time, though, I don't think there's a moment in the original Skywalker trilogy of Luke 
giving up the his journey. I'd say that that's a little bit more prevalent with Anakin's story. Yeah. Especially his relationship with Padme um, through Attack of the Clones and how he was willing to risk his livelihood with the Jedi over his love for Padme. Yeah, most definitely. So, like, after we go through the steps of the hero's journey, we are going to kind of compare and contrast, like, Luke's story and mirror it with Anakin's story because, like, once I read, like, The Hero with a Thousand Faces, like, it was kind of like the, just after, a few years after, well, I guess not a few years after, like, when I first read The Hero with a Thousand Faces, it helped me understand more what George Lucas was trying to achieve with the prequels, and I, I understood, like, that he was, like, contrasting, like, Anakin's failure with where Luke succeeded, so I was able to understand Anakin more as a character and Padme more as a character and, like, what was going on with the prequels. So you brought up a good point. Mm -hmm. So we'll definitely dive in. The next three steps of the initiation is the atonement with the father. And I guess you could say, like, the atonement with the father, it's, like, where the hero has to confront whatever holds, like, the most power in his life. And in most stories, like in many stories, as I say, the hero is like a father figure or like a godlike father figure, power over life and death. And I guess it doesn't necessarily have to like even be like a father. It can just be a mother or just a being or a thing with a whole lot of power. I guess you could say, I guess you could say in The Empire Strikes Back, what could possibly be the atonement with the father, Cody? Luke, I am your father. The moment, like, the atonement with the father that changes everything in the Skywalker saga, it's an Empire Strikes Back and Luke discovers from Darth Vader that Darth Vader is his father and, like, all he can do is just, like, jump to possibly his death, you know, and just after he shouts no. The next step is the apotheosis. And... It, the apotheosis, it is an interesting word, is like kind of a Greco-Roman term, and it means to deify in Greek, or in Latin, it means making divine. It's like deification. When the hero of the story becomes like a god, or even in some cases a god, like Hercules became a god in some versions of his story. It's just an interesting kind of part of stories, I think. Like, not every hero gets it. Like, a few of the heroes get it. But in stories, it's like the point of balance, I would say. The hero becomes an adult. Like, they, they get it. They're in sync with who they're supposed to be and where they're going and where they came from. Like... They know what they're doing. The hero is resolved and ready for the most difficult part of their journey. And from Campbell, Campbell says those who know not only that the everlasting lies in them, but that what they and all things really are is everlasting, dwell in the groves of the wish-fulfilling trees. Drink the brew of immortality and listen everywhere to the unheard music of eternal concord. So I guess you could say, like... Luke's moment of apotheosis is in Return of the Jedi. And he says, I am a Jedi like my father before me, you know? He knows what he needs to do and how to do it. And then, I guess, you know, like in Sherlock Holmes stories, he has the epiphany, like, when he unravels the case. And that could be the apotheosis. So it never has to be, like... It doesn't even have to be, like, a big epic thing. Like, if you just read, like, a short story and the character has an epiphany, that could be the apotheosis. Did you have any more thoughts on apotheosis? I, I think that a great portion of Return of the Jedi, Luke's character, he's either approaching that point or he's approached that point as he, you know, as he approaches Jabba the Hutt to uh, rescue Han and then then he's just kind of sidetracked with helping the rebellion. But once they're on Endor, 
he has that chance to reconfront Darth Vader and he's got that mission to, to kind of redeem his father and so I think with apotheosis that for Luke that starts relatively early not not so much as like towards the end of the of the story for Luke yeah in four and five Luke is very whiny and he definitely needs to learn from his friends and Ben Kenobi and Yoda so a lot of the writers are like okay so Luke needs to learn like when they're writing episode six a lot of the writers are like okay so in five Luke needed to learn to listen he failed so in this one he's gonna learn to listen to them even more and it's like no uh Luke's a man now he needs to learn to trust his instincts and not just like follow what everyone wants him to do uh because Ben and Yoda are just telling him kill your father that's what you need to do and he says no I trust there is good in my father I can also save Han and I can I can save my father there's still good in him and I think I think I can do this you know like he's an adult and just like the highlight I would say of Return of the Jedi is probably just that moment saying like no you failed your highness like I succeeded he knows there's good in his father you know mm -hmm. and it's just it, it's just kind of nice to see Luke go through that journey kind of like from petulant child to whiny child to grown man and Jedi Knight and then the the next step is the ultimate boon the ultimate boon is like the ultimate goal of the quest if you think of like King Arthur and the Holy Grail, the boon is the Holy Grail, you know? It's like what the heroes went on the journey to get in the first place. I guess you could say, like, if you compare Star Wars to, like, stories like The Return of the King, the One Ring being destroyed in The Return of the King, that is the ultimate boon. Then in 4 and 6, you have uh, the Death Star being destroyed. I guess you could even say also episode one there's also a death star kind of figure the trade federation ship is also destroyed it's like would that be the ultimate boon though for for return of the jedi i know that's kind of like a sidetrack story but for luke would... it is a i guess you could say it's an ultimate boon the ultimate boon is probably the friends we made along the way no just kidding um, no i mean for luke i think the ultimate boon was the uh, redeeming his father right because he he set Definitely. up on this goal to confront and destroy the sith but as he progressed in his i guess in his knowledge of the force and as he understood the different perspectives point of views of the the jedi as well as his father he had changed the goal to redeem his father which was achieved at the end so i think that for Luke, that's the ultimate yeah. boon, but maybe for the Rebellion, the ultimate boon was to destroy the second Death Star. Yeah. Luke's A story, uh, his ultimate boon would be the redemption of Anakin Skywalker. Han and Leia and Lando's and Chewie's story, like the B story, their ultimate boon would be the destruction of the Death Star and the Empire. So, it it's just kind of like when you when you succeed in your goal, like your ultimate goal, the whole purpose of why you went on the quest in the first place. So once the hero has gone through the departure and the initiation, what's left is the return or the refusal to return. So uh, the return, there's the refusal of the return, the magic flight, rescue from without, the crossing of the return threshold, master of two worlds and freedom to live so the re the refusal of their turn is kind of just like why would i why would i want to go back you know to the midwestern state that i grew up in you know like like after i've been to like all these big cities and like different you know countries you know mm -hmm. i don't want to go back but in Return of the Jedi, Luke does go to Tatooine to uh, rescue Han. 
And in other stories, after destroying the ring, Frodo is just kind of done with the Shire. Like, he can't return because he's changed. So... I think part of it, too, is the... I mean, there's a point in Lord of the Rings, to be specific, where Frodo and Sam are sitting on the edge of the of the erupting volcano, and they're both just kind of accept they've accepted and were content with not returning home and to die on the mountainside. And what what we're gonna get to a little bit later is like the the magic flight, I guess, like the the enabling of them to return home. And yeah. for Frodo and Sam, that's like the eagles coming to rescue them. For Luke, I think Luke's is a little bit more like trivial because he could have just stayed behind on the Death Star as it blew up, but he has that shuttle that he's able to leave the Death Star on. But there's another point where he's burning the remains of his father, and I'm sure that there may have been like an internal conflict to return to his friends and continue on his journey with you know, whatever their journey is or if he was going to go off on his own and uh, live out his life however he want to live out I'm, I'm sure that there was something going on off screen of his decision to f- return back to lay in his friends yeah so it's like Luke could have just been on like a high like plane you know on his own like as a Jedi but a Jedi has to help the galaxy and, you know, help the Republic. So Luke came back and was with his friends celebrating on Endor, you know? The next step is the magic flight. It's kind of like, in some stories with the magic flight, you get some fun art. Uh, For example, there is Perseus fleeing with the head of Medusa, uh, fleeing from uh, the Gorgon sisters of Medusa. And it's just kind of like like a second round of fun, I guess you could say. It's like kind of the second road of trials. So the hero kind of knows they need to like leave this war zone and kind of get back to things or else maybe the Death Star is going to blow up or they need to get back home in time for dinner, you know? I guess you could say, like, yeah, because Frodo and um, Sam, they get rescued by e- eagles. And then the adventure, you have to get home again so you can have the possibility of another adventure. The next step is the rescue from without. And, like, sometimes the hero has to have help to go out on the quest, and sometimes you need to have help to get back in. I guess you could say, like, in... Th- at the end of A New Hope, Han Solo returns in the Millennium Falcon to help Luke destroy the Death Star. It's help at the end to, that enables the hero to do what they need to do and not die. You know, not to mm-hmm. say like the hero can't die, but it, like it helps them do what they set out to do. And from Campbell, he says the hero may have to be brought back from his supernatural adventure uh, by assistance from without. That is to say, the world may have to come and get him. For the bliss of the deep abode is not lightly abandoned in favor of the self-scattering of the awakened state, who, having cast off the world, we read, would desire to return again. He would be only there. And yet, insofar as one is alive, life will call. It's pretty deep, like... You know, it's kind of like sleeping and waking, dreaming. Like, I guess you could say a dream is like a private myth. And myths are like collective dreams. So, yeah. And it's like you're about to wake up. The crossing of the return threshold is... It's kind of like, in a way, the unknown has become known. Because you've grown up and changed... And the known world kind of is alien to you. And it's like, I just went on this adventure. And now, like, we're going to Denny's for breakfast. And we're just going to see all these people that I used to know. Like, 
from high school, you know, it's kind of like you're returning to your hometown after you've kind of gone off and, and done things, and it's like, you kind of see the pros and cons, you know, like the strengths and weaknesses of the area, like you can see it like with clearer eyes, you know, mm -hmm. uh, but the return, the crossing of the return threshold, it's like the hero has to share what they've learned. It's not just like for them personally to go on an adventure. They have to share what they learned on the adventure. I think that's that's better painted in the Lord of the Rings of Frodo and his friends returning back to the Shire and they're enjoying their their pints of ale and they kind of look around and to them they've experienced so much more but as they look around the bar everybody's just the same person and the they're heroes yeah different hobbits kind of react to it differently you had mary and pippin that kind of just went right back doing what they were doing and then sam what through his journey overcame his fear to marry rosie and frodo never really accepted coming back home but he did write his life's journey into like his his journal which he later gives to sam and then he leaves uh, Middle Earth with Gandalf. So I, I think with The Lord of the Rings, it's, it paints a really good picture of kind of that moment. Becoming an adult or going off on a quest, it's not just meant to be about you. It's meant to not be like about your pride. It's not meant to be about like, you know, just like pleasure, like your own personal pleasure like you're indulging or anything it's like you are coming back changed you're living intentionally as a hero and you are following your bliss aka you're doing what you're meant to do so you can make the world or your community whatever better and like the journey and the return it's not meant to be hedonistic and it's not staying with the status quo like or just being content it the whole hero's journey it's meant to like you face your fear and despair and you don't wallow and you rise and you become who you're meant to be so you can help others become who who they are meant to be and i think it's a beautiful thing and i guess you could say like in star wars the return of the Jedi, the Jedi return and help the galaxy. And they are also Jedi who are able to return from the grave and give, give aid in that way. With the end of return of the, of the Jedi, you just like feel a sense of hope, you know, for everyone. And I guess you could say like one of the last steps, the penultimate step of the hero's journey is the master of two worlds. And I guess you can really see this um, illustrated with uh, Jesus or the Buddha. It's like someone can transcend the material and the spiritual. Like they're an inter intercessor between those two worlds. And I guess you could say it's like when we in our lives become balanced, become our best selves usually an adult you know and also in star wars uh in the return of the jedi luke's become who he's meant to be he's an adult and he's a jedi knight and when anakin skywalker stops being darth vader he's become who he's meant to be and also yoda obi-wan and anakin skywalker are masters of the two worlds because they are able to appear as four spirits after they die freedom to live it's the final step it's when you're back and campbell says the hero is the champion of things becoming not of things become because he is he quotes the bible 
here and it says before Abraham was I am he does not mistake apparent changelessness in time for the permanence of being nor is he fearful of the next moment or of the other thing as destroying the permanent with its change nothing retains its own form but nature the great renewer ever makes up forms from forms be sure that nothing perishes in the whole universe it does but vary and renew its form thus the next moment is permitted to come to pass and what he's kind of saying there is that freedom it means freedom from fear hope anxiety the hero is who they're meant to be they became who they needed to be because of what they they went through it's a characteristic of the hero at the end that they can just be and exist in the current moment without worrying about the past or the future and it's not like they were in the beginning of the story where they're kind of just experiencing the status quo and thinking like I must be happy you know they they just are happy and I guess you can say like at the end of Return of the Jedi you know eventually Luke will become one with the force and he before he does that you know he will teach people and he will save the rebellion and the Republic and if you look at uh, Lord of the Rings as well in the return of the king the hobbits prosper in their home homeland and Gandalf and Frodo sail to the undying lands it's kind of just like a happily ever after uh, did you have any thoughts on the conclusion you know most of the characters of Lord of the Rings kind of felt that way but I don't believe that like Frodo felt that way that's why he left the Shire is because he just he couldn't go back to living a normal life anymore after what he experienced and so he just left but Sam and the other hobbits were able to kind of reintegrate themselves of uh, Sam with Rosie and the kids and Mary and Pippin kind of back to their you know their ways but yeah. but Frodo it was very difficult for him so he just you know he left but I think I think that that's good that pretty well covers the just kind of like the ins and outs of the hero's journey. But just before we close, I just wanted to say that Joseph Campbell, in his own words, described George Lucas as his greatest student. And when I read the hero's journey or, or I watch the power of myth. Or if I, I read other myths or other stories, I can just kind of see the beats of the hero's journey in it. And I think that Star Wars is just paced uh, so perfectly. And I think what George Lucas was trying to show is that where Anakin was the tragic hero, Luke was the hero, like kind of like a fairy tale or a romance hero who succeeded where his father failed. So the father and son, they go through similar trials, but they make different choices, and those different choices are critical. Where Anakin fails because he is too possessive, Luke succeeds because he can let go, and he can, because of that, he can help redeem Darth Vader. Uh, but it, it's just so fascinating to see their journeys, like in 4, 5, and 6, for Luke and Anakin in 1, 2, and 3, they, they both begin as kind of young people. Anakin begins as a 9-year-old, and Luke begins as a 19-year-old, and Anakin meets Qui-Gon, and Luke meets Ben, and then they both lose their mentors, and then Anakin falls in love and can't really let go of what he wants while he's a Jedi and Luke loses in Empire Strikes Back and he kind of learns like the error of some of his ways 
and then you see Anakin fail, given to, like, his possessiveness, uh, and, like, what he wants, and his selfishness, and it overcomes him, and he becomes Darth Vader, where Luke succeeds in Return of the Jedi, and redeems Darth Vader, and becomes a Jedi, so. It's just, it's just interesting, uh, to see how father and son go through the same story. One question I wanted to ask you is, our culture prizes entertainment and commercialization over the meaningful and profound. It can be fun to escape, but at the end of the day, sometimes like it can be juvenile and unlasting. How do you think Star Wars and the Hero's Journey counters, counters that? Do you think it does? It it presents both of the protagonists just kind of like a like a bigger picture of like a meaning that's higher than what they know, and they both are given the opportunity to kind of bite down and fall through with the journey presented. And you see, as you were explaining before, you see how uh, Anakin essentially just decides to give up on his higher call and um, fall through with his passions where Luke was able to set that aside and remain focused on his, like his revised goal. And Luke helps Vader kind of re realign what his original goal was and defeat, uh, evil with Luke and you know therefore bringing balance to the force from the the kind of the conclusion of Return of the Jedi and them both being able to redeem themselves some further reading if you are interested in the hero's journey there is the hero with the thousand faces by Joseph Campbell and it was the first book on the hero's journey there is also Myths to Live By. It was published in 1972. It is full of essays on science, myth, mankind. It has a huge... Then there's also Heroes from Hercules to Superman by Bruce Meyer. He goes over the different kinds of heroes in literature, and it's basically just a love letter to, to all the different kinds of heroes that you can see in many different stories. He would be a great future guest. We'll see if that ever happens. There's also The Golden Thread, A Reader's Journey Through the Great Books uh, by Bruce Meyer. And it's a love letter to literature as well. He covers uh, lots of the like golden books, like the Bible, the Odyssey, Sophocles, the Stephen plays, up to others like James Joyce's Ulysses. And then there's The Writer's Journey, Mythic Structure for Writers by Christopher Vogler. Uh, he was a screenwriter and script doctor. Um, he maps out the journey, describes the stages and the characters, and I would say it's the perfect companion for the hero with a thousand faces. He would be a great future guest, too. If you want to watch things, if you're opposed to reading, or just don't have time, you can watch Joseph Campbell, The Power of Myth with Bill Moyers. It was on PBS, and it has six episodes. And if you get it on DVD, uh, there in the bonus features, there's an interview with George Lucas pre prequels, like just on the just on the cusp of when it was going to come out, and that is also a book. And then there is Finding Joe, and that is by Patrick Takaya Solomon, and it's like a modern documentary follow up to The Power of Myth. And then I would also recommend the prequel Strike Back: A Fan's Journey. It came out in 2016. It explains the ring theory throughout the Skywalker saga, and it re-examines the prequels and all of Star Wars, and it just made me see the prequels, the originals, and, like, the whole... All of Star Wars, like, it made me realize, like, what it was trying to do, and it just made me see it in a, in a fresh way. And then if you are into video games, there is Journey on PS4 and PC, and the audios and visuals, like, it's perfect. 
without even like dialogue or like a really fleshed out story it just like articulates what the hero's journey is it like made me tear up and it's just profound beautiful stunning and it has gorgeous music by Oscar Wintory and I think you can beat it in like two to three hours and it just basically goes through the whole hero's journey I think so I think Final Fantasy is another good like hero's journey example my example i'm gonna leave the unpopular opinion of final fantasy 13 but a lot of people don't really like that game but as a narrative game it has really good points that are brought up with the hero's journey Um, but any of these any of those types of games are pretty subtle with it too so we yeah we just wanted to take take this time and kind of go over the hero's journey as it's really important, influential over the, the Skywalker saga and even a lot of other adaptations with the star Wars theme. So uh, this has been Coden. This has been Cassia. And you can find us at um, twitch.tv forward slash Conan Bon. Uh, if you want to check out uh, streaming with uh, various star Wars games, I am wrapping up with Jedi Fallen Order, so once once we figure out my keyboard problems, we'll be getting back to the Night Sealed Republic and the Night Sealed Republic 2. Uh, for comments and questions, if you want to know more about the hero's journey or just any other items you want us to cover in future episodes, you can find us by our email at ebonhawkpodcast at gmail.com then you can find us on instagram as well at ebonhawkpodcast our podcast can be found on soundcloud and itunes at the ebonhawk our intro and outro themes were composed by alistair shoreman he can be found at alistairsounds.wixsite.com forward slash alistair sounds Our transition music was composed by Christian Walker, and he can be found at christianwalkermusic.com. And this has been episode 12 of The Ebon Hawk. May the Force be with you. We'll be back soon. Bye for now.